you've never seen it before. With unprecedented access, we've been filming behind the scenes for a year. That's why I'm always set. It's the papers that they run by. It's been a year of round-the-clock plotting and high drama. It's like a thing just snapped in the head, and I just said, get your trap shot. All played out in the ancient palace of Westminster that's in danger of collapse. The last thing you want to see is the government building fall apart, that means your government's falling apart. In this episode, we have a backstage view when the Queen comes to open Parliament. The frillies, the jambon on the cuffs. You'll have to be paid out later. Talking to a Tory? No, I've never spoken to a Tory anyway. And we see the lengths to which MPs will go to make their voices heard. I once prepared a 24-hour speech. As front and backbenchers fight to control the agenda in the countdown to the general election. It's mid-May 2014. And in three weeks, the Queen will arrive to open the new parliamentary term. Everything must be spick and span for Her Majesty. Craftsmen are sprucing up the royal apartments in the House of Lords. That's what I like about this. The coronation damask. Lovely. It's the original damask that was used in the coronation, 1953. Isn't it beautiful? John Gazelle has worked for 30 years on the lighting for Westminster state occasions. We weren't allowed to light these pictures when the French president came. Because they're both Nelson and Trafalgar are what to do. From here, Seated beside her husband in the Chamber of the House of Lords, the Queen will make her speech to open Parliament. The throne is now lit, but now we're checking to see if Her Majesty's got two no shadows. Her Majesty only has one. At the opposite end of the Palace of Westminster, in the Commons, parliamentary officials from both houses are rehearsing in plain clothes for the piece of theatre that's come to define the state opening. It represents a pivotal moment in Commons history. The last reigning monarch to set foot in the House of Commons chamber was Charles I, and it followed his coming into the chamber to demand the arrest of five members of Parliament. This was one of the defining acts that led to the Civil War, and when we came back as to what is known as a constitutional monarchy, so there were certain checks and balances, and one of which was that the monarch would never interfere with politics and the affairs of the House of Commons. The Lord's official, known as Black Rod, will play the star role. The uh, doors will be slammed in Black Rod's face. Because Black Rod is the messenger of the Queen. Having slammed it in his face, we open the doors and he's amazing. Open the door. So it's just a little annual reminder of the independence of the Commons from the Sovereigns. I like that, you know, reminder that the independence of the House of Commons has had to be won over uh, centuries and that even now we like to slam that door and remind the monarchy that we are the elected representatives of the people. Though it's called the Queen's Speech, it is in fact written for her by the Cameron government. We will outline the coalition's pre-election plans. But a number of backbenchers on both sides of the House have different ideas about what issues they want to pursue in Parliament in the coming year. One of them is the Conservative MP, Robert Halfon. So, uh, my breakfast is often a cigar and a, either a Coke or a coffee, a Diet Coke, for concern, which is very unhealthy, but it's very relaxing to smoke your way in. Robert Halfon is a new MP, one of 35% who won seats at the last general election. I got elected in 2010, but it's something I always wanted to do since I was uh, 10 years old. 
and one of these terrible people joined the Conservatives at 14 and uh, worked in the Parliament for MPs in different capacities at various points in my life. Having said that, I have sold double glazing for debt collecting services and um, done other kinds of work, but most of it has been politics. It's been a passion, it's a way of life. Robert Halfon was born with a form of cerebral palsy. Although he's a Tory MP, he's been a highly effective campaigner against his own party. He's already pressured the government to freeze fuel duty, to cut the bingo tax, and stop visitors being charged to go up Big Ben. The Chancellor, George Osborne, reportedly dubbed him the most expensive MP in Parliament. How many hospitals have we uh, emailed now? Five hundred. Right, and there were thousands. Now thousands. With a new term about to begin, he isn't waiting for the Queen's speech. He's planning his own campaign to ban parking charges in NHS hospitals, with Emily, his researcher, and Maria, his press secretary. Do we have a, an average figure for hospital car parking charges? No. The Chelsea and Westminster Hospital is £20 a day. £20 a day, okay. I get a lot of emails because people really, really hate it, because it's so unjust. Robert Halfon is again aiming to take on his own party's leaders. Most of the campaigns I've done, which are national campaigns, have really come out because of local people writing to me. These guys give me a slap if I'm doing stuff that isn't really relevant to my constituents. Literally, by the way. Especially Maria. <laughs> he's been such an effective campaigner against his own government's policies that he's now the butt of a running joke from Labour MPs in the Commons that he's in the wrong party. Can we have a statement on nurses' pay and hospital car parking charges? So that we the Labour frontbencher Thomas Doherty has become Robert Halfon's biggest taunter. And could I ask my honourable friend to suggest that the uh, honourable member opposite keeps his trap shut because... <laughs> oh, no, that's enough. They, oh, that was tasteless. I had enough because he did it last week as well and something just snapped in the head and I just said, get your trap shut. Thomas Doherty is also one of the 2010 intake. And he's already been promoted to the front bench. Cheers. You're a star. His deputy to Angela Eagle, who's Labour's shadow leader of the Commons. By the way, 17 years today, Labour landslide. <laughs> Thomas, text me with how many people are standing up. Part of his job is to negotiate as much time as possible on the floor of the House for Labour issues. In doing so, to his surprise, he sometimes finds himself working with the enemy. One of the things that you learn quite quickly when you become a Member of Parliament is that actually if you want to achieve something, one of the things you have to do is make allies, not just on your own side and with the other parties on your side, but with the op opposition as well. You have to work together to work the system. It's a week before the Queen's speech, and John Dursell, the lighting director, is in the midst of his preparations. The Palace of Westminster is a maze of tunnels and towers, and the wiring system required to light the state opening takes Dursell to its highest turret. Was this the size of people many years ago to try and get through these little doorways? <coughs> Just tip it up a bit, that one. There was a mishap here one year. The sovereign was in the House of Lords, but everybody was, or they all remember, all the Coleman's walks through, and everybody walks through, and all this went out. Right. On the eve of the big day, MPs take on the House of Lords in a symbolic battle. Women MP's team is captained by the Conservative Penny Morden. She's been chosen by David Cameron to open the debate in the Commons after the Queen's speech. It's a great honour. I'm 
first woman to do it in 57 years, only the second woman ever in the, um, in the Queen's reign. That's very stressful. Uh, we are very used to speaking in Parliament, but you're supposed to be funny. You're supposed to be funny and not too political, which is very difficult. It's the morning of the state opening. And for the Commons' top brass, it's best bib and tucker. For the speaker, John Burko, this is the state robe that I wear on the occasion of the state opening. The sergeant at arms, Lawrence Ward, who's in charge of security. The frillies, the jabot and the cuffs, um, I will wear when there is a head of state that visits. The clerk of the house, Sir Robert Rogers. There we are. All done. <laughs> and the principal doorkeeper, Robin Fell. Well, that's the uh, Police and All Service Medal. That's the order from John. And that's the order of the British Empire. Well, I've been excited on my first two or three, but I get excited now. Mildly apprehensive. There's something strange going on in the cellars. Of the guard are tapping the floor in their ritual search for barrels of gunpowder. It's quite good, isn't it? I find it quite loose. It goes back to uh, Guy Fawkes. It's more ceremonial now. We'll go marching through. <laughs> As the Commons doorkeepers line up for their annual group photo, the Sergeant at Arms realises he's forgotten his white gloves. Robin, we've written with your white gloves. You can get the other side there, sir. Could the associates remove their gloves, please? I'll tell you why later. Please have a great day. You know, today is about fun. Good luck. I'm done. Everything's on. Everything's cool. Except for one little bulb, which is going to be done now. And then we go to breakfast. A beautiful poached egg in the House of Lords canteen. It's 11 a.m. and the Queen has set off from her palace to the one in Westminster. And MPs head to the Commons Chamber to await the summons from Black Rod. It's, it's, this is a brand new shirt. It's brand new. Well, not brand new. It's brand new clean. So. That's nice. Mm. Product. Mm. Uh, God. What were you like then? Yeah. What were you like then? Stevie Marriott. That is actually it's not well, is not it? Hey, no. It's, uh, it's, you get the back room on the back. You mean the bloody back room? <laughs> I'm going to hide in that doorway so that I get out and get him to... Uh, close to the front of the queue. It's a you know, historic moment of our country, really. It's the last part um, of Queen's speech before the general election of the of a coalition government, so it's a special moment. This is very encountering him. When you see this, see the Queen that will be thrown down if you think it's a Stick to the Proud. Hey, Bob? Yeah, definitely. My lords, pray be seated. He's a nice man, that's right. I'm not saying that John Burke are right. <laughs> Close the west door. Close the door. Repair that later. We'll be wrong. <laughs> Is this Black Rock? Uh, open the door! As Black Rod enters the chamber, MPs are bracing themselves for another rather newer tradition. <laughs> Her Majesty the Queen commands this honourable house attends Her Majesty immediately 
in the House of Peers. Coalition's last stand. Coalition's last stand. Let us go now and has an important constitutional role as part of the pageantry of the state opening, that you need him to make a sarcastic comment, and when he finally retires, somebody else will have to take that role on. At 11.30, MPs are ushered through to the Lords, where they'll stand behind the peers to hear the speech. The Labour MP, Steve Rotherham, is giving it a miss. Given that I've done it a few times previously, and it's not the most dynamic thing that you can be involved in, and the Lords gets particularly packed and very sweaty, I decided to stay in the chamber. For the leaders, it's the chance for an informal chat. But what do they talk about? David Cameron will often talk about our families, because we've both got young kids, and um, we compare notes on the struggle to combine being a politician with having a family life. A key priority for my ministers will be to continue to build an economy that rewards those who work hard. My government will reduce the use of plastic carrier bags to help protect the environment. Back in his office, Steve Rotherham decodes the speech. Continue to do that on its long-term plan to build a stronger economy and a fairer society. And I actually think she means my government's legislative programme will make a valiant attempt to strengthen the economies of London and the South East in order to benefit the wealthiest in society. Legislation will be brought forward to tackle avoidance. What she really means is, in instances of tax avoidance, my government will target Jimmy Carr, but not Gary Barner. <laughs> As MPs return to the Commons, they've heard a speech that promises to end modern slavery, cap welfare benefits, reward pensioners, and give constituents more power over their MPs. But on both sides of the Commons, there's a feeling that in the fifth year of the fixed-term Parliament, the Coalition is running out of steam. Rather surprised we're legislating about plastic bags. What we've got is some kind of tactical thing that they've cobbled together at the last minute because they can't agree on the big issues. So there's inevitably going to be less in it, especially at the end of a coalition government because there's less agreement with the parties um, uh, to that coalition and also because it's just coming to the end of the parliamentary session. One notable omission from the speech, because the coalition can't agree on it, is the vexatious subject of an EU referendum, leaving the Eurosceptics far from happy. There was nothing in the free speech about Europe today, obviously. Hello. Right, uh, thank you for considering that, Prime Minister. Well, thank you. MPs head to the Commons for the Queen's speech debate. The opening speaker is traditionally supposed to be funny. This year, it will be Penny Morden. Order! It was Penny Morden. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The last woman to open the debate was the Tory Priscilla Tweedsmill. Over 50 years ago, when the Labour leader was Hugh Gateskill. Mr. Gateskill, with gallant intent, I am sure, replied that Lady Tweedsmuir had probably made some good points, but that he, alas, was unable to respond to any of them. For such was the distraction of her soft, attractive voice. <laughs> She then recalls her training as a reservist in the Royal Navy. Fascinating though it was, I felt that the lecture and practical demonstration on how to care for your penis and testicles in the field <laughs> failed to appreciate that some of us attending had been issued with the incorrect <laughs> My office did take the trouble to look up whether those two words had ever been said on the floor of the house the before. Words, yeah. Penis and testicles. And um, they have been in a medical context. Um, and we did check that there was, they, that saying them would not be unparliamentary, um, and concluded that they were things and therefore could be said. The leader of the opposition. Ed Miliband compliments Penny Morden on her speech. 
and on her appearance on the ITV diving program, Splash. It certainly takes guts to get in a swimming costume and dive off the high board. Can I say to her, if she's looking for a new challenge, she should try wrestling a bacon sandwich. <laughs> But the mirthful mood of the house changes sharply as the Commons reverts to punch and duty politics as usual. This is what the Queen's Speech should have done, Mr Speaker. A make work pay bill to reward hard work. A banking bill to support small businesses. The Queen's Speech doesn't do that. What he does have is a ragbag, lucky dip, pick and mix selection of 70s statist ideas the leaders and their partisans continue their ritual jousting across the chamber. But over the coming year, with a coalition government deeply divided, some of the biggest issues will be fought out by backbenchers. Yeah, start switching them off now. We want you to go all the way through. Okay. Thank you very much. That's it. 2014, all over. As spring turns to summer, MPs on both sides look for ways to promote their own policies. One key way of doing this is through a private member's bill. It's an important thing, the private member's bill, because it is the only time that a private member really gets a chance, officially, to get a piece of important legislation which they attach great importance to, or their constituents do, through the House of Commons. There have been uh, great pieces of legislation through the private members route, not least the David Steele, the abortion bills. It's a fantastic campaigning opportunity. It's a fantastic opportunity to sort of raise a campaign that you've been working on for many years. It just gives you the profile, it gives you the platform to do it. The clerk in charge of private members bills is Kate Ems. Over the past three years, she's overseen a vast array of bills. Face Coverings Prohibition Bill, the National Service Bill, the European Communities Act 1972 Repeal Bill. Any MP who wants to draft a private member's bill has to register it with Kate Ems. Fishing Grounds and Territorial Waters Repatriation Bill, School Governing Bodies Adverse Weather Conditions Bill, and so it goes on. There are limited slots in the Commons timetable for private members' bills. So the competition is intense, and it's decided by a drawing of lots one week after state opening. Morning, James. Could you just find for me the tickets for the raffle and show me the tickets in the box? OK. So this is the box we use every year for the raffle. And I think, are these the tickets here? They're the tickets, yeah. So we've got 500 of those. The process is a bit like running the raffle at the village fate. The first stage takes place in the voting lobby by the House of Commons chamber. Hello. Form an orderly queue. To enter the contest, MPs have to choose a number and then sign their names in Kate M's book. Right, Mrs Reardon? Yes, please. Because the number is mine. I have. That probably would have been taken. I've been told it's like bingo because I've not done this before. So apparently we have to choose a number and then they, well, I hope they've got like a big bubbling ball. That they yeah, sort of yeah, you've got a big box with balls in you. Yeah. Big box and it draws, draws them all. That's what you want. You pick number at the pit. That's what I'm going for, the dear. Have you done yours? I've done mine. Yes. What number are you? 364. Uh, is that got some significance? It's the highest score by an English batsman in a test match. So now I need to yeah. pick a number that has some relevance, obviously. That hasn't already been taken. That hasn't already been taken. Yeah. 296, I've had to. It's how many times you've been sent off. <laughs> it's my pen. This was what I got when I was 30, that I always used for special things like this to sign. So I think it might be good luck. The whole point of being here is to try and change legislation, so to get a, a gift and a leg up with this, um, even if just the sort of the profile that the topic gets would be an absolutely amazing thing, wouldn't it? 
It's an opportunity for backbenchers to make their mark, but there'll also be pressure to toe the party line. With the coalition split on an EU referendum, Tory ministers want to use a private member's bill to get it through. The Whips try and remind people to go and put in, so we've all had a reminder today to come and line up, which is why there's so many people here, I think. A lot on our side want to because they want to try and get this EU referendum bill, which was stopped by Labour and the Liberals and the Lords last time, so we want to get that on the statute books. If I want it, uh, I would definitely repeat the referendum bill. If I get the chance, it'll be to have a referendum, an in-out referendum on Europe. And that lot will all boo me! <laughs> <laughs> that lot me! Don't that lot me! <laughs> Robert Halfon isn't prepared to trust that luck will give him the chance to promote his campaign against NHS hospital parking charges. But there is another way for him to appear on the Commons stage. You can sign it on the next page there. He's buttonholing MPs as they come out of the voting lobby to persuade them to sign up to his campaign. We don't like you to say so I've met with hundreds of colleagues from all parties and no chance. Robert Halfon will take the signatures to the Backbench Business Committee, which allocates slots in the chamber each week for debates suggested by members. That's the most draft motion, and it's a bit like Dragon's Den, this uh, Backbench Committee, so I've got a bid for a debate. To be successful, he needs to show that this is not just a Tory issue, but has cross-party support. Now, by a miracle, are you free for five minutes? Um, possibly. I don't need to mean that. Oh, look, I don't want these filming. Can you? No. That's talking to a Tory? No, I've never spoken <laughs> to a Tory. Like... Well, I've been to the backbench committee before, but sometimes they've said no, and I've just gone back every week until they say yes. So if they say no, I'll go get more signatures, and I'll go back the week after. And if they say no, I'll get more signatures and go back the week after that until I just try and find them in submission. It's the 12th of June. Nice early start. The day of the ballot for the private members' bills. Kate Ems leaves her house at 7 a.m. The one chocolate because I give a small non-monetary gift to all the people who've helped me in the book. Good morning. This is for it is. It's not all for me. <laughs> It's a big day because it's the beginning of potentially a lot of very entertaining hard work. It's exciting. So here's my box. And here they are. Very lovely kids. Right. And here's my ballot book back from the printers. And here's my list for today. The winner of the ballot will have the first choice of time slot and the best chance of their bill making it into law. That's for you, so you've got a piece of paper. Across the Westminster village, backbench MPs monitor their emails for the result of the ballot. The draw is made by the Deputy Speaker, Lindsay Hoyle. As of last year, the ballot results will be drawn in reverse order. As each number is drawn, I will read out the corresponding name and the member in the ballot box. 200 Martin Horwell. Probably barely get any time in Parliament to even talk about the bill, but it is obviously an opportunity to, to push a cause that you believe in. 190. Mr David Davis. In a way, I always say to people, the best one to get is either number one or number 20. You know, number one, you've got a very high chance of getting through the number 20, no chance at all. It's kind of something deluged with a number of emails from a combination of lobbyists, uh, charities, and, and several emails from think tanks. Go for the last three. Rodman. 146. Robert Neal. It's great news because it gives you a chance to, to actually, you know, Make a difference, and then it's going to be a lot of work. Take them off there, we can't get the section going. 196. And from George, the winner of today's draw. It's the MP equivalent of winning the, the National Lottery. 
I have to make a judgment really about whether I want to go down in history having done something kind of worthy but extremely boring or actually be controversial and you know I still get my my day in the sun even if it's voted down Mr. Bugger never mind sadly I'm not on it but uh, maybe next year but for the winners the ballot is just the start they'll face many obstacles if their bills are to become law you make a choice if you go in for something that is controversial and will raise the ire of somebody on the other side or even in your own, on your own side then you will have your hour or two of glory where you won't get it through your private members bill has no chance if it doesn't have the support of a either a majority government or the two main contributors to the coalition. For those MPs who weren't lucky in the ballot, there's a third route to getting time in the chamber to put forward a bill. They'll have to turn up at Kate M's office in three weeks' time and queue for the few remaining time slots. And it'll be first come, first served. Thomas Doherty wants to seize this opportunity to make sure that Labour bags as many of the time slots as possible. My task is to secure time on the floor of the House so that we can debate our issues and allow us to demonstrate what a Labour government would do in its first term. The way that it's been done in previous years, it has involved members getting their days ahead and camping out, literally camping out in an office. So I will probably arrive two days before Kate Adams unlocks her door um, to, to the front of the queue. He's come up with a cunning plan to make sure he's first in the queue. We've reached a deal with a couple of Tory MPs so that over a couple of days rota we're going to cover off all the time. So I will do the night shifts and so in return for being hardy um, I'll get to go to the very front of the queue. He's decided to team up with two Tory right-wing mavericks, Peter Bone and Christopher Chope. Together they plan to grab all of the slots available. Thomas Doherty hopes to pull a political masterstroke which will get him time in the chamber for Labour and embarrass the government by giving a platform to dissident Tory voices. Ah, oh, uh, They plan to camp outside Kate Holmes' office for the next two nights. Okay. I, I, I can do Hello, three yeah. How's the living accommodation next door to your office? Please tell me it's empty, first of all. Thank you. So we saying tomorrow night? The problem I've got, one of our colleagues is having a party on Wednesday night and I said I'd go to it. What I was thinking was, if I start at 8 in the morning, if someone can cover from 10 till 12, we've got some appointments. I'll come back at noon, I'll basically push on till say 7. If someone can do 7 till 10, I'll get some refreshment, which should, which should harden me for the night. So I have my sleeping bag and pillow in my office. 10 to 12 I can do. Great. Okay. Yeah, that's not a problem. I can come out they need to strike a deal about how to share out the spoils. How many bills are we thinking of doing? Well, forgive me if I don't want to get involved in the internal mechanics of how the Conservative... No, no, how many, how many bills do you want to do to put forward? If we take two of the top five members' bills for each side... Sounds good. As far as I'm concerned, I've just got to make sure that I'm at ten tomorrow. Yes. Yeah, and then we rest them all flow from there. Great place. Thank you so much. Cheers. Have a good evening. Thank you. Over ten, isn't it? Over ten, we'll vote. Yes. Yes. We won't be in the same lobby. Peter Bone claims there's a point of parliamentary principle at stake. If we don't do this at ten o'clock on Thursday, people who have been given bills by the whips on both sides will turn up to do those. Well. That's not what private business is supposed to be about. It's about, should be about what private members care about. While MPs concoct their plots, in Westminster Hall, the lighting designer John Dussel is preparing for his next big event. 
to commemorate the centenary of the Christmas Day truce in the First World War. There'll be a joint concert by the choirs of the German and British parliaments. What I like is when people sit down and they look and they go, this is the roof of all roofs. It's amazing. Built nearly a thousand years ago, Westminster Hall was where King Charles I was sentenced to death. Winston Churchill lay in state, and Henry VIII used to play tennis. He found one of the tennis balls with Henry VIII stuck up on one of the beams when they were went for cleaning. So it's got a lot of history in this building. Behind the scenes, the craft team are at work, keeping the building running and on call for a variety of jobs, some more unexpected than others. If we're not backing off there, send the search party out for us. The locksmith, Peter Basalo, has been asked to investigate a mystery locked room in the cellars. The sergeant at arms is concerned it may be a security threat. Just along there, as you can see, this gives you an idea of the scale of the building. That's from one end to the other. It's taken me about three years to find my way around in the basement. This is the door that we're concerned about. <laughs> a lot of people in the outside world, they would just put a drill through the door, drill the lock open. Because of where we are, we don't like to do things like that. That's it. Storeroom, isn't it? It's got a house of all, so it's uh, possibly an also the catering department. Well, at least we know where we are now. Lots of jam. You can really chicken in there. <laughs> 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 A week after the private member's ballot, the Lib Dem Andrew George visits Kate Ems in her office to seek advice. Oh, you're welcome. Right. You're welcome. Congratulations. Okay. Major result. Well, skill rather than, you know, yeah, obviously. No it. luck involved at all. Have you had any thoughts about what you might want to do for your bill? Uh, well, I've had an avalanche of suggestions from new friends that I didn't know I had, and I also have an avalanche of my own ideas. Oh, okay. <laughs> so if, if I give you an example, so an affordable homes bill, one clause of which would be to try and nullify the most unacceptable um, aspect of the, the spare room subsidy, the bedroom tax. His bill would exempt people from the controversial bedroom tax if they'd been at the same address for more than three years. It would effectively neuter a key government policy. So that's one, and we, we might call that, let's say, for, as a working title, the Affordable Housing Bill? Yes. Yeah. For, uh, for homes. Yeah. Because that's a, yeah. Well, we'll a see how word. we go with that. Okay. But even though Andrew George has won the top ticket, his position isn't safe. Some Tories want to push their EU referendum bill to the front of the queue. Now, I've been approached last night by Philip Davis. Um, he said it's not black mail, of course. Uh, but if I don't step aside and allow his Tory chum to have first crack at, at the first Friday and allow uh, that bill to go into committee before mine, then he'll talk my bill out. Fine. Talking a bill out or filibustering is when opponents deliberately string out the debate until the allotted time for a bill runs out. In um, trying to prevent the passage of a bill, members can try to take up time and they will give long speeches. We have all done it. Uh, in fact, I once prepared, uh, 20 years ago, a 24-hour speech. Most members of Parliament quite like the sound of their own voice. Fault which I attribute to myself among them. It's the 1st of July, and Thomas Doherty is about to begin the 48-hour occupation of the room opposite Kate Hemm's office. Uh, good morning, Mr Doherty. Second in. Do you want to the showers on? That would be splendid. Oh, well. We can't be accused of spending a lot of money, can we, on a... Perfectly serviceable. Uh, okay, and it's very convenient. It's an open window ventilation well, system. Can we make sure it was a frosted glass. 
<laughs> While Thomas Doherty is staking his claim outside Kate M's office, Robert Halfon is waiting for the doors of the Backbench Business Committee to open, so he can put in his pitch for a Commons debate on hospital car parking. The Labour MP Natasha Engel chairs the committee. We've had loads of people writing to us with, um, with proposals and we've not been able to do anything about it. So they're just piled up now, so it's going to be a huge number of people who are going to come and see us today and we've hardly got any time to allocate to them. So I'm going to have to be particularly tough. Robert Halfon is hoping his long list of cross-party supporters will be enough to make him stand out from the rest. Emily, can you tweet? The, the, yeah. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman. We are asking for a debate on the problem of hospital car parking charges. As you can see, um, we've got um, support for the debate from 108 MPs from all parties. What the 108 MPs have signed is for um, the motion to have a vote on the government considering ways in which hospital car parking fees can be reduced. Having put his case, Robert Halfon has to wait for the committee's decision. We've got our Facebook page, everything on it, so we'll put you back it. We'll call you Hero of the Week or whatever for it. Thanks a lot. I'm relieved it's over, to be honest. It's quite nerve wracking, but uh, as I said, it's Dragon's Den, but uh, it's. Uh, uh, I've got to go and see a nurse from my hospital now um, who's come here to talk about nurses' pay. It never stops. As MPs head home, Thomas Doherty arrives for the night shift in the 48 hour vigil opposite Kate M's office. So you're very, um, very good time. Just as a uh, first of all, I am nothing if not a, uh, a car watcher. <laughs> the Tory Christopher Chope and his wife have been holding the fort for the last three hours. Where are you going to sleep? <laughs> I'll take six of these chairs and line them up. Um, <laughs> two rows of three. Okay, that's fun. Have a good night, rest. See you later. Yeah. It's fine. Yeah. I hope the chairs are more comfy than we look. Yeah. Two thousand. Yeah. Good night. The slightly less gracious bit of this is trying to climb into my seat. Mike. <laughs> <sighs> As Thomas Doherty beds in for the night, the Commons becomes a very different place. It morphs from Hogwarts into a night at the museum. On this floor, I work alone. It's just me, or I might see the gods when they come around to do their rounds. It's very quiet here at night. Spooky at times. If you hear a little sound, you jump, you know. After two nights in his sleeping bag in the Commons, Thomas Doherty doesn't have much longer to wait. Morning. So I got my head down. Um, about half a minute. Um, and uh, that's not bad actually. Well, I woke up twice. I'm so tired that actually I was able to sleep right through. It's 9.30am. In half an hour, 
MPs will be allowed into KTM's office to claim the few remaining time slots. We're nearly there now. Got um, these members to deal with this morning. I've just confirmed that I've got the right day. My wife has just asked whether I've had breakfast. Note you want to bring tea and toast to four members to the bunker. I'm going to get a rude response on that. <laughs> the answer was no. <laughs> The odd menage a trois have been able to keep their ploy a secret from the rest of the house. The Tory MP Andrew Percy is on his way to KTM's office. I think the government and the opposition whips decide between them who's getting which week, um, so there shouldn't be anybody there. Otherwise it would just be crazy because you'd have somebody in this world up and lined up for every single one. Private bill office. Uh, it's that lift there, isn't it? See, I did know where I was going. The sergeant at arms has sent a doorkeeper to prevent any trouble. I'm just here for a bit. The common quiet authority. By 9.45, the Commons' only Green MP, Caroline Lucas, has taken up her position outside KTM's office. Are you waiting for a ten minute rule bill? I am. Oh no, because last time I came there was just me here. I'm surprised, I mean, I've, I've done one of the overnighters before um, to try and get to another the first Oh, really? You had to wait overnight? Yeah, it's mad. Oh, look at the time. Ah. Time for KTMs to open up shop. Have a seat, Mr. Doherty. Thank you so much. After two days camping out in the bill office waiting room, Doherty, Chope and Bone are first in line, and they bag all the best time slots. Hello, how are you? I'm good. Thanks. I want a ten minute rule, Bill. Right. All the ones that came free today have been taken, I'm afraid. They've been queuing on a rotor system since Tuesday morning and overnight in order to be here at 10 o'clock this morning. I'm just a failure. No, I don't think that's true. I didn't is get it? pulled I out in the private member's bill. With that attitude. I didn't get a 10 minute rule bill. I think, like, frankly, you need to. I'm letting people down. <laughs> um, this this well, could I, spoil my weekend. I really hope it doesn't. It would be a great shame and possibly slightly out of proportion. I just wish I was better like anybody else. <laughs> I can't help it. Forty-eight hours have been a long time in politics for Thomas Doherty, but he's bagged a precious prize. He's put nine Labour bills on the agenda and gained a whole day of time in the Commons. If I've got to give up a couple of nights comfortable kit um, to guarantee that we can have a debate in the House of Commons, I think that's a sacrifice I'm prepared to make. It's Wednesday the 2nd of July, and the winners of the private members' ballot will be the first to introduce their bills as starting the lengthy process. Step one, the titles of their bills must be read out in the chamber. Uh, safety and quality bill. Second reading what day? Friday the 7th of July. Third on the list is the Conservative Bob Neill, who will be introducing the EU referendum bill. Sir Andrew George, affordable homes bill. The biggest cheer is for Bill Number Three. Sir Robert Neil, European Union Referendum Bill. Yeah. While there's no truce between the warring coalition partners, in Westminster Hall the stage is set for the Anglo-German concert to commemorate the World War One Christmas truce. And John Gazelle's lighting is once more being put to the test. It's been a good day so far. Black Rod seems to be happy. Um, he shouted up my name uh, on uh, on the rehearsals that I hadn't given him enough light for him to read his music. So we've looked after him so he can actually see his music. So he seems to be very happy today, so that's okay. I often have a coordinating and organising role. Someone's going to knock him into shape, and quite often it ends up being me. 
By six in the evening, it's a full hall. The choir's gonna, gonna come in. Rather than processing down here, the word they were using is they're going to ooze down here. Ooze! <laughs> Thank you for coming in such magnificent numbers for this auspicious occasion. It's a week since Robert Halfon appeared before the Backbench Business Committee and has just received an email. Well, we won't get our debate before the summer recess, which is fine. Would I be able to put a hold to debate on 1st of September? That's amazing. We can say that we have got a debate. We can say we have got a debate. That's fantastic. He'll now be able to make his case for the Chancellor George Osborne to find the money to make NHS hospital car parking free. But then he has a mystery caller. This came as a kind of bolt from the, from the blue. Last, um, I think it was Wednesday evening. It was either Wednesday evening or Thursday evening. I get an email saying, Mr. Switch would like to speak to you. And Mr. Switch, and there was a London number. And I'm thinking, who on earth is Mr. Switch? That's a really weird name. And I ring the number. And it's the Downing Street switchboard, and literally your heart goes like this, jumps, and uh, then they say the Chancellor would like to speak to you. When I say it was unexpected, I was expecting to speak to Mr. Switch rather than the Chancellor. And he gets on the phone and he said, um, I'd like you to be my Parliamentary Private Secretary. I said, it's a great honour, and thank you. A Parliamentary Private Secretary is the lowest form of ministerial life. Hello, it's um, Rob Halfon at one meeting. Thanks a lot. But it's often the first run on the ladder to a proper paid job in government. Right, so do this. Thanks, hi, hi. Hello, Rob. Hello, who are you? Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you too. Thank you very much. It's a great opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. What are you doing this summer? Are you going away? Um, well, I'm doing a fitness thing for a couple of weeks. I've lots of exercise, swimming, physio. I've got to get fit, so uh, especially for the election. Especially fit for the election. Yeah. yeah. Now, well, Lisa, you've got to be my eyes and ears, and you've got to. You know, I, I want to hear what's not working as well as what is yes. working, and and also we need to know what the, you know, what our MPs want from us. And I have specific issues that they'll come to us through. They'll come to you first. Yeah. yeah. You're welcome to the team. Thank you. <laughs> the Chancellor has decided to deploy the persuasive skills of his former Bete Noir to his own cause. But now that Robert Halfon is inside the government tent, his days as an entirely free agent are over. I can campaign, um, but obviously I've got to, uh, I'm a kind of semi-member of the of the government, so I've got to think, uh, um, because you, you, you're slightly, uh, you know, you're slightly constrained, but I've been able to make the case for it in science, which I would never have been able to do before. Speaker. It's the 5th of September. The day of the debate on Andrew George's affordable homes or bedroom tax bill. He's anxious that some Tories, keen to clear the way for their EU referendum bill, might obstruct his bill by pointing out technical errors in the way it's drafted. I've been given an indication that I may be challenged, I just wanted to be sure that I could actually say, well, the clerks have looked at this and scrutinised it. I'd like to make sure that it's reasonable for me to, to refer to your authority you rather can, than to my, you can, my judgment. You can say the clerks in the public bill office have scrutinised the text of the bill. All right, no, no, thank you. Well, you're I'm very good. I'm as well. Okay, thank you very much. I'll be there at the beginning, I'll be there at the end. Thanks. All right, lovely. Okay, okay thanks. You yeah, cheers to you. I'm sure that I've done all I can do. It's, there's no confidence about what's going to happen today. Totally unpredictable. 
The debate will begin at 9.30 and must be finished by 2.30. So the greatest threat to Andrew George's bill is a filibuster. Tory Eurosceptic Jacob Rees-Mogg is a master of the art. I won't speak at great length if others want to do so more than I do, so, but yes, I can share a word or two on this debate. Mr. Andrew George! Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The area, the policy I would like to advance the case for is that to address the desperate need for affordable uh, accommodation of... No sooner has Andrew George opened the debate than the Tories make time-consuming interruptions. And I have been... Um, I will just, if, if, the, if the honourable lady, if she wouldn't mind, just allow me to make this point. Uh, no, I will not give way. I, the, I, I'm well aware that there are a large number of members who wish to speak in, in, the, in this debate, uh, and therefore I don't intend to uh, speak for long. Soon the filibustering begins in earnest. Mr Speaker, I do want to congratulate the uh, Honourable Member for St Ives on coming top uh, in this year's private members' uh, bills uh, ballot. Although, of course, when I say he came top, he wasn't first. He was, in fact, 20th, of course. And, uh, in fact, the first Honourable uh, Member whose name was drawn out of the hat in the ballot uh, was uh, the uh, Honourable, uh, my Honourable friend, the member for Cheltenham. Mr. Nutton, you've been speaking for 35 minutes. The rest of the House will be desperately disappointed that he does not elaborate on all these points. After three and a half hours, Andrew George presses for a vote to end the filibustering and move to a decision on his bill. The Deputy Speaker decides the opposing voices have been given a fair hearing. Division, clear the lobby. With Andrew George's opponents out in force, it looks as if he won't have the hundred votes he must have to win the vote. But Labour have spotted a chance to defeat the Tories. They put out a three-line whip to summon as many MPs as they can to support Andrew George. The eyes to the right, 304. The nose to the left, 237. Yeah. Whips have been caught off guard, and an ordinary backbencher has defeated the Conservative Party. This is a phenomenal and really exciting outcome, and to get it through where the main party in the coalition government is strongly opposed to it, I think is a remarkable outcome. It gives us a great opportunity, really, now to, to forge ahead. It was absolutely private members' bill world. I honestly didn't always expect that to happen. Mr George has won the day. Andrew George has only won the first round. There's a long way to go before his bill can become law. Robert Halfon is about to have his day in the sun, but it's bittersweet. We come now to the backbench motion on hospital car parking charges. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When the debate he's fought for for so long finally goes ahead, Robert Halfon has been muzzled. As he now works for the government, he must watch from the sidelines. We have to remember that the NHS should be in the interest of patients. The debate raises the profile of Robert Halfon's campaign. But it won't change the law. For that to happen, he must lobby the government to introduce legislation, something he's now much better placed to do. It's been a long slog. Uh, you know, it's been many months of campaigning on this issue, and it wasn't even on the agenda. It's a really uh, great step, but it's worth it because um, it's been a great. Would you say it's been a great day? Yeah, I think it was. I thought it was a really good debate. I'm looking forward to go to bed tonight. I must make this. I'm so knackered. Andrew George's triumph is short-lived. A few weeks later, his bill is debated at what's called the committee stage. The Tory filibusters like Jacob Rees-Mogg are back in force. 
But I want really to talk about time. Time like no rolling stream bears all its sons away and dies forgotten as a dream does at the opening day. Um, you can see uh, when they're engaging in this uh, a smirk uh, on their faces as they enjoy engaging in evident verbal diarrhea, filibustering, uh, in order to play for time and to frustrate progress. I believe that it's important that we uh, proceed and we don't play uh, childish political games with something which is actually extremely serious. While the Tories continue to block Andrew George's bill at every stage, the Lib Dems refuse to make way for the Tories' EU referendum bill. With the governing parties in deadlock, neither bill will pass. So the final outcome of a tortuous Commons contest is that there's been a great deal of noise and heat, but very little light and no winners. Next time we explore the legendary dark arts of the Whip Toughnesses. That's the Whip We meet some of Westminster's younger members. So I'm going to go and take my son to go and get him into his pyjamas. And show how the traditional party system is falling apart at the seams. Basically, democracy lost and the government won. Are you interested in finding out more about the topics raised in this series? Then go to bbc.co.uk slash inside the commons and follow the links to the Open University where you can watch topical roundtable discussions and get an insight into the making of the series. The politically historical documentary David Starkey's Magna Carta is available now on BBC iPlayer. Well, Gilbert's all at sea next, a minnow in the world of fishermen, with so much to learn on his work experience. Thank you.